Good morning, everybody. I think we're almost complete. Maybe some more people are coming. It's less than we expected, which is not a bad thing because we're on a fairly tight schedule um, if we want to get everything done that we prepared for you. So my name is Martin. This is Marvin with a V. He's from Weave as well. Um, we're both developers at, at Weave, which is a company focusing on um, IoT and blockchain. What we're doing is making sure that IoT devices, which could be everything that starts with smart, smart TV, smart watch, smart coffee machine, whatever, um, is applicable to a blockchain. And we will learn about why this is so. So five minute warm up. Um, we don't have to rush that much. But what we want to do is we want to split you in groups. And once we've finished with a um, 25 minute um, information part of the, of the, um, of the show, then we <coughs> go uh, and work in groups on potential uh, business scenarios that only work out if you combine smart devices and blockchain. So uh, it's up to you then what you think is a, is a good case. You know your business is better than, than we do. And uh, in the end, it should be a fun thing to just work on one specific thing and then present it to the others, which we will be doing with um, five minute lightning talks. So once you're at the um, group work session, try to keep it as, as concise as you can. If you have an idea that is too big, you will not be able to present it in five minutes and we will cut after five minutes sharp so everybody gets a chance to have a say. Um, okay, first is the, the problem. When data is generated on a blockchain, then it is uh, trustworthy by definition because it was created within that system. But if you create data outside of that system, let's say off-chain, in an IoT device, let's pick the smart coffee machine, then you cannot uh, trust in that data uh, from scratch. You have to authenticate it. You have to make sure that this data is valid. Otherwise, you'd basically break the blockchain by pushing it in. You'd destroy what makes it great, which is trustless uh, interaction amongst participants of the of the network. So there is a solution. <laughs> We're basically building it, um, which is a operating system that is running on, on devices. If this was my smart coffee machine, um, I would have to run it, on, uh, Weave OS on it. And after that, I wouldn't have to worry about the data that it creates anymore. I can trust in that data because we're taking care for cryptographic security and all that needs to be done. And it's uh, quite a lot that you need to keep in account uh, in order to make it work nicely. Yes. Come in. <laughs> More people. That's great. Um, come in. So why are we doing this? I uh, try to put it into a very simple frame because it can be quite abstract if you think about blockchains and IoT and everything working together. So, this cow is Heidi and she's eating weeds and that makes her happy and productive. And Heidi is capable of distinguishing between fresh weeds and rotten weeds. And she would never eat the rotten weeds because she'd get sick. So she has a means of deciding what is good. What food do I trust in? This one, that's Heidi from Boston Dynamics, is consuming data, needs to eat data in order to operate properly, but cannot distinguish between good and rotten data. <coughs> and this is why we cannot have a <clears throat> data economy based on a blockchain if we can't make sure that the data that comes in and will be eaten by devices like Heidi um, we cannot be, be, be certain that they won't break or do something crazy if they eat rotten data and then run into that wall. So <laughs> if you want to put it into a picture, we're making sure robots and machines don't get sick. Um, and this is why we're building Weave OS. Now the theory part is coming. And um, first of all, let's... Uh, quickly check, um, who of you knows what a Merkle tree is? 
Okay, who of you knows what a hash is? Very good. So we're somewhere intermediate and we should be fine. Who of you is blockchain developer? Okay, so you can go to sleep for 25 minutes. <laughs> Um, just <laughs> yeah. Now we're going, actually we're rushing through what makes um, blockchain go around. And I want to not use the word blockchain from now on for the rest of my speech, but replace it with the word computer. <coughs> blockchain is such an abstract word and nobody knows what it really means. So let's talk about the world computer. It's one computer, as if you only had this laptop left on the planet, and everybody who wants to use a computer would have to connect to this very laptop. So a blockchain like, ex for example, Ethereum is basically a world computer. And this is how we have to think about it because it can run programs and do all crazy sorts of things. But everybody relies to the very same source of computation, which makes it great. Um, to understand it better, let's describe what regular computers like this one does when it operates. It's boring for you, I know, but um, what we do is first we write a script. And a script is basically a well-formatted question that you want to ask the computer. You write down your question and then some magic happens and you get an answer. answer. The magic that happens is you execute whatever was written in your question and it goes to the memory, which is where the computer remembers what you wanted to ask him and allocates some space. And then it goes to the brain, which is the, the central processing unit. And this will spit out the result to your question. This is called read, evaluate, print loop. So this thing is doing a level. And it will go in circles forever and ever and ever and ever. This is how programs basically work. And you will get different results based on other input that you fed into the very same question. I imagine this question would be, am I a male human being? And I fed in myself, it would result to yes. If I fed in a girl, it would result to no. So read, evaluate, is this true what I have been asked and then say yes or no or even other outputs. This is, looks like theory, but in, in fact, it's really easy to understand. The step that we just had, executing a script works like this. First, I write down a definition of a question. This question is a, a function, but it, it's basically a question. It, it says, first of all, write this to the screen, then whatever I put into X and whatever I put into Y, print hello X, Y. And this thing basically runs this entire um, function. This is the, the function call. So what happened? First, it said, hello stranger. That's OK. Then first, I typed in Martin. That went into X. Second, Maura, that's my surname, went into Y. And then it was uh, asked to print hello XY. So it says hello Martin Maurer. It's really simple. And whenever people tell you programming would be hard, it's not hard. It's a bit complex, but it, it all boils down to these very simple read, evaluate, print loops. You can stack them and nest them and make them really horrible. But if you keep it simple, programming is not very hard. Now we have the world computer. This is what the regular redevelopment print loop did. We have a very similar, very similar thing happening with a world computer. Because you write a script. If you do it on a blockchain, you have to call it smart contract because it's more fancy. <laughs> In the end of the day, it's a script. And that fancy script, first of all, it, usually you would store it on your hard drive this time. You just chuck it into the world computer. You, you just throw it there and you don't give it an address and it will get its own address and from there on you can call functions. Somebody then will use one of the functions that you threw into the world computer and that could be a person, that could be a, another smart contract, that could be a machine that knows how to do it. And 
when a function call is being issued, the network decides, oh, I need a computer to, to, exe to execute that. So it borrows somebody's computer. Some of the network participants, they're called miners, but they will just share their, their hard drive, uh, their, their, their memory and their, their processor for a second so that the, the REPL can, can do its job. This will return the answer to the network and the uh, network will then give you the result. So basically, it's the same thing. It's just that there is no, not everything happening locally, but you can make use of a global network of computers that will allow you to execute code, which is pretty awesome. Um, because this means everybody relies to the very same machine. So if you write a program, you can be sure everybody who runs that program runs the very same thing. So if you want to have a global application and you put it in there, you can be sure whoever uses it will be um, agreeing on the very same thing. It's not a copy, but physically the same program running. So <laughs> this makes you share everything. Now, this is a bit hectic in terms of wrapping your head around it if you never heard about it before. If you don't get it in the first run, that's totally fine. If you don't get it in the fifth run, that's still totally fine. I know a lot of programmers with 15 years of experience who need a couple of repetitions to understand everything and how it interconnects. We just do this because it's um, really nice knowledge and you will, you will remember it in, in the future when you talk about uh, this thing and you will understand much more than just talking about the business implications that come on top of it because the business implications is uh, fairly uh, obvious, but this is not. So, the blockchain, and this is supposed to be blockchain, because the blockchain inside the world computer is nothing but a database. So the world computer has got a database with um, entries, and in these entries, it's full of hashed records of computational transactions, that means Every time somebody did a re-evaluate print loop, it is written down what happened. It's snapshotted and it is being hashed. Hashing is this. A hash proves you own a file. Before I explain how it really works, let's go here. The entity of all the records of all the transactions ever made on the world computer, ever since it came to life, are nothing else but a file, a big one, because there's all the entries in there, but it's a file. And if you want to work with that computer and everybody wants to work with the same state of the system, you want to prove that you have the right file, because this is what you need in order to work with a shared computer system. So how does hashing work? It is arbitrary input and it will give you the same length output. So if I put in my name with a blank space here and I hash it, I will get this thing. And nothing else that I put in will produce that very, let's call it an identifier. It's a checksum. But I could throw in everything. I don't have to throw in, type my name in a, in a field, but I can throw in a, let's say, MP3 file. Any file. It's a mechanism of proving that you own a file. Why it is important is what we're going to see soon. Um, utterly important, it is very unlikely that two inputs share the same output. That's not going to happen. Um, it could happen, theoretically, but it's super unlikely. It's because this number, I don't know how permutation is called in English, but you have so many combinations that this number is easily enough to produce outputs for any input you could ever imagine. <laughs> okay. Breathe? <laughs> That's a lot of information, I know. Merkle trees take hashes as an input. Like, 
Ma taking Martin Maurer as an input gives me this hash. What I could do is I can take this hash, make it the input, and hash it again. And this is exactly what Merkle trees do. They take an input, let's say an image of a red square. I put it in, get my hash. An image of a yellow square, I hash it, I put it in, and then I do a pretty clever thing that was uh, introduced by Ralph Merkel, who is the most important person when it comes to blockchain because he laid out the fundamentals. It will result in a new hash based on those, th those two inputs. I hash them together. And the, the color coding is quite nice. Red and yellow will result in orange. And blue and green will result in, uh, um, I don't know the name of that color. And these two together result in this. So what it does is, as long as this thing is valid, or is what you expect, you know everything that made, we call it the root, the root hash, Everything that made has to be valid. It is really a theoretical thing at first, but imagine this and this would be the state of the world computer, everything that ever happened. Everything that ever happened at this point in time is this. Now, 15 seconds pass, all the transactions that are being computed by that machine go into this to make sure everybody on the system knows the latest current state of the system, we mix them two together and get the new hash. It's getting more clear here. This is the root, so red. And this is 15 seconds time. And in the 15 seconds time, what you find in here would be all the read, read evaluate print loops that happened. Somebody calling a function, somebody else calling a function, somebody else calling a function, somewhere on the planet. All these need to be mashed up with this thing, and we need to tell everybody on the system about the new latest state. And this is why it's called blockchain, because this is blocks, and they are mashed into a chain. But what this thing really does is, it will keep a record of everything that ever happened computationally in that world computer, in that global laptop that everybody wants to use. You will not need that knowledge for what we do in the workshop, right? You will not need it. I just tell you because it's, um, you're still fresh. It's the first class of the day, uh, so we can go on theoretic topics. Um, computing on the world computer is basically like running a script on your computer. It's nothing that special. So if people tell you mm, blockchain developer is a really very, very sophisticated thing to do, I'm a blockchain developer. And I was a business dude not so long ago. So it can be understood because it works very similar to what you know from computers anyways. You just have to imagine there was only one left. The one, the more sophisticated word for this would be singleton. In programming, if there's only one entity of something, it's a singleton. And the world computer is the singleton computer. It's one computing unit. So how do we talk with a world computer? What we need to do is we need to write a script. At the moment, that's mainly Solidity. It's a programming language that was made to um, write scripts, questions, well-formatted questions for the world computer. So somebody, once it is uh, saved to the network, can ask for answers. All these basically are questions. They expose a variable, which is public. Uh, 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 the entire thing is public, and then you can chuck in your data and it will return with whatever, um, whatever it was made to answer. So, and that's a bit um, new, let's say. That would be me. That's one of my Ethereum addresses. That's my name and I'm a normal person speaking Solidity. That's some smart contract. So this is another script. So when it comes to, to 
the world computer, you are equal to a script. A script can do basically whatever you can do. It can talk to another smart contract itself. It can call a function. It can provide data. It can basically work like, I don't know if you know the movie Matrix. There's these dudes with the suits and the sunglasses. They are supposed to represent malicious programs. This is what smart contracts really are. They are not malicious, but they are autonomously working agents. So I tried to phrase it. That would be a chatbot speaking solidity, if you want. So that's me speaking solidity. That's the chatbot speaking solidity. We both talk to the same script on the world computer, and we can both interact now. This is basically how, it, how you always talk to the world computer. And this is pretty much it. Now we can move on to the, to the workshop part. Let's do a quick recap. <clears throat> the world computer is like one gigantic laptop that all network um, peers connect to. So you just need one. The world computer is a trustworthy machine because it's design, as we saw based on the Merkle trees and on the hashing, makes sure that everyone gets the same state, so we can rely on that thing. Data from outside can be brought in with Weave, which we're really proud of for the first time. Um, so you don't have to worry about the data that comes in from the outside world and just write awesome applications. Programs running on the world computer are totally reliable because the world computer is reliable. <laughs> Scripting is very similar to standard programming. So if you know about JavaScript, you will have a, a, a really quick and easy entry into Solidity. And most important of all, robots don't get sick if they consume data that we provided with the Weave operating system. Enough theory. What we would like to do now is something like that. The smart Coffee machine? No, we will make a different example. It's easier to understand. Let's say there was a car, and that was sort of smart because we flashed our operating system onto the chip that uh, does the, the board electronics. So the bumper detects a hole in the road, and it triggers. It will send that information, that piece of information, to the world computer and say, hey, I triggered a pothole somewhere at geo-coordinate whatever. Then an awesome service to the world would be, hey, why not making those cars, providing that information for road maintenance companies, and ideally, maybe there's people coming and fixing it, but ideally, the optional nice part, why not ordering a drone to autonomously repair the road and let all of the people inside the system pay each other automatically. That would be really cool. If you drive around, you hit a pothole, you get paid for that information, some drone comes and fixes it. That would be one of those end goal scenarios that might very well happen. But what uh, I would ask you to focus on for now would be your awesome service to the world if you take all of this for granted. Because you can. We did the foundations of why you can take this for granted. But for now, don't worry about it. Don't worry about the technology, the underlying. And just focus on what kind of, of service would you now build in order to make the world a better place. And this is basically what I wanted to tell you. And now we can, I think I didn't go for too long, did I? All good? Okay, then we, um, we need groups. We are not so many people, so you can basically form groups as you like, or if you have an own idea, write it down. We've got material, everything you need here. Um, and try to make it in 30 minutes, then pitch it to the others. The ones who dare. <laughs> <laughs> and I will uh, write down one myself. If you have got questions or if you need further information, you can ask Marvin and myself. 
or if you have questions right away, we can do very, very quick question and answer, if you like. So if there's any questions uh, straight away, just ask them or raise your arm, or we move on to the. Yes, please. Um, I do not have one, but you can give me yours. Um, I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> LinkedIn will do. Wait, wait. Um, take a picture of this. There, you can find us. If you want to find us straight away, you go to, to Gitter, or you come to the website and there's a Telegram channel, and then just say hi, and you will find us. 